So what significance does this shop hold for me as a gamer? Let's find out. Since Spaces. G'day invaders and welcome to Since Spaces and I am on location. This is the suburb of Woolaware in Sydney, Sutherland Shire. And this is the town that I grew up in up until 1982. But we're talking about 1978 in this video. And well, you're probably wondering why am I uh, pointing my camera at a beauty therapist? Well, that store was a milk bar. That store was a milk bar back in 1978 to 1982 and they had pinball machines in there and also a little game called Space Invaders. And that was the very, very first game that I ever got to play. They also had uh, other milk bars down there as well. Milk bars used to be a big thing here in Sydney back in that era, but they kind of died out now. And they had also Space Invaders down there in colour <laughs> with the colour cellophane film over the top of the screen to make it look like it was colour. Um, not really many other games were being played at that time. I do remember uh, Phoenix, which is another shoot 'em up game being released a little later. Pinball machines, there's really not much else to talk about, but if I just swing the camera around here, uh, that place there that you see with the white flowers, that's actually my old, my old house the flat and uh, yeah I grew up there until I was about eight years old used to walk all the way down to here and play my very first um, play my very first video game so yeah um, but they also had another shop down below there which was like a takeaway store which is still still there as a takeaway store today um, and they had also Space Invaders down there and across the road is a corner store and that is still a corner store. Uh, after all this time, there's still a convenience store. And I used to buy stuff like Pac-Man cards and Battlestar Galactica cards, Kiss, Kiss cards. Um, yeah, so that really pretty much dates me. But anyway, we'll head back to the house. It's really windy here and it's hot. Um, we'll head back and talk about 1978 and the games that were coming out in that year. So if you rewind back to 1978, uh, well if you did that a lot of you probably wouldn't be born and uh, that would be bad for you guys. <laughs> but to look back at 1978, uh, there's a couple of things you have to take into consideration that affected video games in that era. Uh, pinball and pool tables, well they were still big, they were still huge, especially here in Sydney. Uh, not so much the case anymore but back then pool halls and uh, snooker uh, centres were everywhere and they were quite a big common thing to be able to find a pool table a hall in your local suburb. Uh, unfortunately though for complications uh, since then involving alcohol uh, licences that's no longer a thing in Sydney. Um, still a thing in South Australia though, I saw when I was there. Anyway, uh, also Atari, the, uh, the VCS or the 2600 as it later was become known as, that was a console that was released in that year. That was a big deal, but when it first came out, not so much. It struggled when it first came out. It wasn't only until years later that uh, big console, uh, sorry, big name games started pushing sales for that system. Um, Ironically enough, Bushnell, who was um, the, the starting founder member of Atari, he was fired by uh, Warner, who bought out Atari, as I mentioned in my previous video. Um, he was fired by them in a similar style to how Steve Jobs was fired by Apple, and then, well, he later, Steve Jobs got rehired. Bushnell, he didn't. He actually left the video game industry after that. Uh, the other things that you got to take into consideration, Nintendo for, released their first arcade game, Aphilo. Uh, not a huge big deal, but um, I guess it was just them you know, testing the grounds and seeing what's involved in making video games and arcade games at that time. Uh, so that was a, a big thing for 1978. Uh, also, uh, Ballet or Midway released their own uh, arcade, uh, sorry, console machine called the Ballet 
professional arcade home console. Um, now, I don't really know much about this console, to be honest. I don't think it was a thing here in Australia. Uh, but it was part of the second generation console. Um, uh, and also, it tried to be uh, not only a games machine, but a kind of like a PC. Um, but it kind of failed at both, which is a bit of a shame. Uh, it was originally released in 77, but was more widely uh, available in 78, but it failed. Um, so there are a couple of things that were big in 1978. Not a lot happening. The industry was still young and still not uh, a lot involved in that industry. Now, I was going to go on to talk about uh, one of my Game of the Year's uh, category, uh, contenders for 1978. Uh, I think I'll leave that one for last because it's really, really important. Uh, so, with my first candidate for Game of the Year for 1978, Fire Truck. <laughs> really creative name. Uh, the only reason why I picked this game out was because it was one of the first true two player cooperative games. See, so it was, uh, I'll have a graphic of it up there, but it was basically an arcade machine where the guy at the front would operate. The accelerator and brakes and steering while the guy at the back uh, he, he had to or she had to um, operate and steer the uh, the ladder section of the uh, the truck so you know not nothing overly exciting um, but it still would have been fun back then to have two players trying to cooperate with each other and probably failing miserably uh, it later got re-released as a single player um, cabinet which kind of defeated the, the main selling point of that game, which I think was a bit odd. It actually had bells and horns, uh, didn't do anything to the game, just made lots of noises, which was cool. Uh, there was no storyline though with the game, which was a common uh, thing with video games back in the uh, uh, late 70s and early uh, 80s. Uh, and uh, yeah, so that that's Firetrack, nothing overly exciting there. Uh, in my other game for 1978, was basketball for the Atari 2600. Now this was one of the first single player games that had you up against an AI opponent and, uh, and an AI opponent actually was worth playing against so that was pretty cool. It also featured uh, one of the first games with 3D perspective graphics so there was a big um, move forward there in, as far as breakthroughs in video games and it also um, was to feature in one of my favorite movies of all time uh, Flying High otherwise known as Airline uh, or Airplane sorry uh, starring Leslie Nelson uh, that got a little brief cameo in that movie a couple of years later but my game of the year <laughs> this is a pretty obvious choice this is the third game in my uh, uh, contenders but this is, you know, there's no drum roll needed for this one. And it, it's such an important release. Um, Space Invaders. Japanese Tato machines had a joystick, so that was one thing that was different from the Japanese release of this machine. The ones that we got here in the West had buttons. And I, that was one of my very first critics as a game player, was that I didn't like the buttons. And uh, I later got to see it with the joystick and found that it was uh, a lot easier to control the, uh, the, the what, what would you call it, spaceship, the basis, I don't even know what it really is, but you're defending Earth uh, uh, device. Um, what is it called, guys? Write in the comments below what the, in, in Space Invaders, what is that thing meant to be? The, this thing, is it, is it a cannon? I, I don't know. Um, anyway, it was created by a gentleman by the name of Tomohiro Nishikado. And he single-handedly came up with the game himself. He uh, developed the and engineered the actual camp cabinet himself. He designed the game. He designed the four-tone music. And uh, that's another big feature of this game was that it was the first game to feature a music backdrop. So again, another huge thing with this game that um, separated it from everything else that was being released previously. It is only four tones are going over and over again in a loop, but it is such, anyone that's played Space Invaders knows that how, uh, how important that is to the game and the experience. So, so you knock off these aliens uh, and you are left with only one alien racing towards you. Your heart beats real fast as you're trying to kill the damn thing. Um, so it was 
such a huge aspect of the game. Another a rumor about this game is that once you knock off all the uh, opponents and you're left with one and it goes faster, it was not meant to be like that, that, that was a bug. I don't know if that was a bug. I, I kind of think that he left that in as a deliberate um, feature, uh, despite what some people would tell you. Um, probably there was a lot of limitations with getting this game uh, into uh, fruition, is that what you call it, <laughs> to get this game developed. Um, there was probably a huge limit on what you could do. I mean, it was only black and white, there's one thing. You had to put color overlays to make it a color game. That was something that came out years later. So the designs of the uh, aliens that you see was actually inspired by War, uh, War of the Worlds. <laughs> so that's something that, you know, I often thought was, how did he come up with these designs for the aliens? Well, apparently, he saw a, a, an artist uh, illustration of War of the Worlds and uh, he used that design to simplify the representation of, of all the alien ships or monsters. I'm not really sure what they're meant to be, to be quite honest, all these years later. Um, and that icon that you see is actually represented uh, to portray video games in general. So if you see that on a on an icon somewhere, you know that they're talking about video games in general, not necessarily just Space Invaders. Gives you an idea of how important this game was. It also was the first game to feature um, high scores, as you can see up there, uh, and also just the scoring system was a big thing back there. The Mothership uh, had a mystery bonus, so that was something that was uh, you know really cool at the time, was to try and go all out to get that um, that uh, mothership. Uh, arcades in Japan opened with wall-to-wall -wall spaces machines and um, you can imagine just uh, these arcade uh, centers with nothing but space invaders uh, being opened at the time and this is something that would not be seen again until Street Fighter 2 came out and even then it was not as big of an impact as what space invaders was. Um, and Street Fighter 2 obviously wasn't until many many years later. There's also rumors of the 100 yen coin shortage. Now this is a story that you keep hearing in uh, these kind of videos where when Space Invaders was uh, popular for the first time in Japan that uh, there was, it created an, an artificial uh, shortage of 100 yen coins because everyone was just racing to play this game for the first time. Um, I kind of call bluff on this rumor. The uh, reason being is that these companies that were uh, these arcade centers that were raking in the 100 yen coins at the time they would have been banking that straight away so these um, these coins would have ended up back into circulation at the bank soon I, I totally don't don't buy into that uh, rumor at all there's also um, a rumor going around there that the same thing happened in America uh, again I, I don't know I don't I don't see that there's anything really much there to support that it's uh, true um, Plausible, but not not likely. So Space Invaders definitely cemented gaming in my life. It, it created the ground rules for what video games was meant to be about. You've got your credits down there, you've got your lives, you've got your high score, your scoring. It basically gave me the foundation of what I was to expect as a player from a video game that I was to um, either insert coin or buy or press start or whatever <laughs> this was the game that outlined it from the start for me and I didn't get to play this I don't think in 1978 I would have been too young I was about four years old so I think maybe around 80 1980 or 81 would have been more um, more around the correct mark there so that's been my look at 1978 gaming since spaces and uh, yeah, I'm glad you guys uh, enjoyed the video. I hope you did anyway. Uh, I had a bit of fun looking back on that year and I know that uh, breaking down each year by year up until current time is going to be a bit of a challenge, uh, especially trying to pick game of the year. Now 1978, that was a, a, a no-brainer that Space Invaders was going to be 
uh, the game of the year for 1978. And uh, it's kind of fitting that uh, in 2018, we are about to enter uh, the 40th anniversary of Space Invaders. Now, that definitely makes me feel old, um, but it just shows you that this industry has come such a long way. And uh, I'm glad that, I've always said this, and uh, I've said it quite often, that I'm glad that I have grown up in the era that I have because I've got to see gaming grow as I've grown up. Uh, so yeah, I hope uh, to have just as much fun with 1979 and 1980 etc onwards with uh, my videos that I have coming up. Um, and if you haven't already done so, please leave a like and subscribe if you haven't done so. And uh, don't forget that I have got a Patreon uh, page and I'll leave the link here somewhere. Uh, it's uh, I've got four patrons at the moment, so a big shout out to you guys. You keep the channel going. Um, I don't really have anything else much more to say, except uh, my name has been Brian, and I've been gaming since Spaces. Now you know where the name comes from. <laughs> Thanks, guys. Since spaces.